Welcome to this extended podcast. We have created this presentation primarily for the members of the National Quality Improvement and Clinical Audit Network who asked us to provide them with the main findings from our last annual survey carried out in December 2016. This short presentation provides an overview of the survey, key themes in relation to local audit, key themes in relation to national clinical audit, a short section on reinvigoration and a few concluding remarks relating to more recent developments. I'm now going to hand over to my co-director at Clinical Audit Support Centre, Tracy, who will commence the formal presentation. Thanks Stephen and thanks to NQICAN for asking us to feed back on the survey. Before I provide some information about the background in relation to the survey, I'd like to say a very big thank you on behalf of Clinical Audit Support Centre to everybody within the clinical audit community and to members of NQICAN for their support of the survey year on year. To give you a brief piece of background, the survey has been running since 2010, so we've got seven years of comparative data. We always run it as an online survey and we make sure that we keep responses anonymous. That's very much to try to encourage people to respond. And whenever we've looked at the completeness of returns, they are very good. Usually when people start the survey, they go through and complete it fully. It runs every year in December, so usually opens on the 1st of December and runs through till Christmas Eve. The structure of the survey, we haven't changed very much. We have added a few questions in, so the reinvigoration questions were added in 2015. We obviously will be looking to run the survey. It will be opening again on the 1st of December 2017 and we're making plans to sort that out at the moment. We're very happy to consider a couple of additional questions if NQI can would like to add something in. To give some information about return rates, in 2016 we had our most ever with 218 returns. The breakdown provides some more information, but 57% of those were clinical audit professionals. We also ask people if they're prepared to tell us which sector of healthcare they work, and within that 56% of respondents work within acute trusts. Today we're just going to provide you initially with some information around the key findings within the survey for 2016. First of all, let's start to look at some of the questions at a local level. The first question I'll focus on is, do you feel more positive or negative about clinical audit than a year ago? This is a question that we've been asking each year since 2010, and the graph shows you the results of the differential between the positive and negative remarks. In 2016, the, it was the first year where negative responses unfortunately outweighed the positives. So to give you a feel for the results, 29.4% of respondents said they were more positive about clinical audit, with 33.6% of respondents saying they felt more negative in relation to clinical audit. The remainder, 36.9%, effectively said they felt neither more positive or more negative about clinical audit. Following on from people's feelings about whether they're more positive or negative about clinical audit, we also asked the question whether people intend to still work in the area within five years. You can see the graph on the screen shows you that in 2010 we had a, effectively a high of just over 75% of people really keen to be working in clinical audit in five years' time. That sort of ebbed and flowed over the, the last few years, but within 2016 we had a result of 55%, so obviously quite a drop from that 2010 figure. I think patient involvement is something that many of us within clinical audit have grappled with over the last few years. We always ask people within the survey to rate their level of being able to involve patients in the clinical audit process. And you can see from the graph that results generally haven't changed very much. People feel that probably this is quite a difficult area 
and most people tend to rate their involvement of patients in the audit process as being poor. Resources for local clinical audit tends to be a hot topic. It's something that often gets discussed at network meetings. The information in relation to the question about resourcing in the survey shows that rarely do teams get more resources for clinical audit. Most tend to find that they either have less resources or that they simply have no change in the resources. I think this is borne out by examples like people when um, team members leave, they often don't get replaced or it can take a long time for them to be replaced and this obviously causes an added burden for the teams at a local level. And now I'm going to focus on the National Clinical Audit Projects. We always ask respondents if they will rate the quality of National Clinical Audit Projects that they take part in. The information on the graph shows that the overriding response to this is that people will rate the National Clinical Audits as moderate. Uh, this has been consistent over the seven years of the survey and it'll be interesting to see what the survey in 2017 shows and whether there's been any change. Alongside an overall rating, we also ask people to give some more specifics about the projects that they're involved in. Consistently, the most effective national clinical audit has been the Sentinel Stroke Audit. So congratulations to the people involved in that particular project. It is always well regarded within the survey. To flip-flop over, we also ask people to provide information about the least effective national clinical audit. Obviously, these are listed for you to see from 2010 onwards. The good news is that in certain circumstances where a project isn't seen to be effective, they are taken off the NCAPOP programme. I'm looking particularly at the 2012 entry here for the National Heavy Menstrual Bleeding Audit. For information in 2016, the National Audit of Intermediate Care was identified as being the least effective by our respondents. I'm now going to hand back over to Stephen who will talk in more detail about the free text comments that we received in relation to the National Audits and then offer a few concluding remarks. Thanks Tracy. You will see from the slide that we were able to distill the many comments we received in relation to National Clinical Audit into a number of key themes. We obtained most of these additional comments by adding a question into the latest survey asking respondents to tell us how National Clinical Audits could be improved. I won't go through all the, the comments and the themes um, identified via the slide. We've created an additional um, infographic that will be available via the website and that will send to NQI can members to take a look at but broadly the main concerns raised by our respondents was the sheer workload involved in conducting many of the national clinical audits ineffective and delayed reporting and there was some particular attention paid to concerns around um, methodological deficits um, in relation to national audits quite a lot of our respondents noted that um, Many national audits don't follow the true clinical audit approach. So that slide gives you a bit more detail about um, some actual free text responses from um, those who completed the survey. You'll see from the next two slides that uh, many of the respondents really didn't hold back in terms of their thoughts around national clinical audits. Um, there were some particular comments noting that the national clinical audit programme is very uh, acute hospital focused. So you'll see third comment down a suggestion that not many of the national audits were, were relevant to those working in mental health and we had similar comments from those working in community and other settings. Um, there was also, as I said in the previous slide, concerns raised around delays with um, often audit data from national audits being out of date by the time it gets back to, to those who've um, collected the information. Um, there were also comments around um, how the National Clinical Audit Programme was um, impacting on local delivery and you'll see from this slide that uh, there are quite a number of points that are very pertinent to the NQI CAN members. You'll see top comment our local audit team is being overwhelmed by NCAs and I think the other quotes that we've took, taken from the, the survey 
give you a, a clear indication of the impact that national clinical audit is having um, on what local clinical audit teams um, can do and how could they can support their their clinicians. This next slide will be of particular interest to NQRCAM members and those working in clinical audit as it sums up some of the key themes in terms of how our respondents felt that national clinical audits could be improved and I don't think there's any huge surprises here. Um, one of the suggestions around fewer but better quality national clinical audits is something I think we'd all endorse. They do need to be streamlined. Reporting issues clearly persist and we need um, clinicians to be able to access more real-time information. We at CASC have talked a lot about broadening out the National Clinical Audit Programme so it focuses on a wider group of patients across different settings. And I think really the bottom um, comment there is particularly pertin pertinent. Um, it's a suggestion that we would um, very much definitely endorse. There needs to be um, more involvement of local clinical audit professionals in constructing um, and helping set up national clinical audits. Turning our attention away from national clinical audit for a moment, we just wanted to focus on reinvigoration and people will be aware that in 2006, Salim Donaldson, the then NHS Medical Director, laid down a challenge that we needed to reinvigorate both local and national clinical audit. And we've included a number of questions in our survey in uh, 2015 and 2016. So if we look at the first slide, this provides us with results in relation to responses to the question, has local clinical audit been reinvigorated? And you'll see that um, over both years, um, we've had less than a quarter of respondents saying that local clinical audit has been reinvigorated. If you look at the far right um, section of the, the slide, um, you'll see that there's been quite a rise from 2000 to 2016 of almost 10% in respondents reporting that a local clinical audit hasn't been reinvigorated, which is, which is concerning. You'll see if we take a look at the next graph focusing on whether national clinical audit has been reinvigorated, very similar results. So again, less than 25% of respondents over each of the years of our survey reporting that National Clinical Audit has been reinvigorated, where again on the far right we see quite a jump in those reporting that, in their opinion, National Clinical Audit hasn't been um, reinvigorated. So quite a similar graph um, for views on National Clinical Audit reinvigoration uh, as per uh, local Clinical Audit reinvigoration. This last graph focusing on reinvigoration of Clinical Audit is a little bit more detailed and takes a little bit longer to get your head around but what we have here is essentially the results from 2016 in relation to those that reported yes in response to the question has either national or local clinical audit been reinvigorated so on the far left hand side you'll see that of all respondents 21% stated that national clinical audit had been reinvigorated and a similar number in relation to local but to the to the right of the line you'll see that we've broken respondents by sector down. So um, you'll see that just to the right of the, the line, we've got the results for the acute, and they're far more positive about national clinical audit, with nearly 27% saying that, in their view, national audit has been reinvigorated. If we compare that to mental health trusts, the, the response there is just 12.5%. And if we look at uh, community sector, um, just one in 10 said that national clinical audit had been reinvigorated. As regards uh, views on local audit reinvigoration, you'll see that pretty much across the, the main sectors, acute mental health and community, um, the results are, are very similar. So that pretty much concludes the feedback in terms of the qualitative and quantitative results from our survey. We just wanted to move on um, and provide a slide around limitations. CASC always look at the work that we do and, and critique it. And uh, I think it's always important to, to bear in mind that no survey is perfect. So there's a little bit of information here in relation to what we feel are the limitations of, of the survey that we've undertaken both in 2016 and the, and the previous six years prior to that. Um, there are a number of questions, not that we've really focused on in this extended podcast, that focus on 
cask and bearing in mind we're the ones who are sending out the uh, the survey and data is being reported back to us essentially there's a possibility that a few of the responses might be slightly biased towards um, cask we appreciate that not all of the the um, questions are perfect it's, it's impossible to get a perfect set of questions for a survey uh, an example of, of a, a, a question where we have a, a potential problem is that there's one that asks um, will you be working in clinical audit in five years time and we've seen results as Tracy's already explained um, dropping off for of that over the seven years where we've collected data um, evidently the uh, the response that people could give to that question would depend on their personal circumstances so if they're coming up to retirement then uh, there's much more of a likelihood that they won't be working in clinical audit in five years time uh, as I've mentioned some of the questions could possibly be phrased um, slightly better um, we try as much as possible to prevent any gaming in relation to the survey so we limit responses to uh, one response per computer but it, it is possible theoretically if uh, if people wanted to that they could um, provide a number of responses across a number of different computers if they were so inclined um, we don't know the population for the clinical audit community so although we know we've got over 200 respondents in our 2016 survey and we've had over 100 for every survey that we've run since 2010 we don't know um, how this relates to um, the number of people working out there in clinical audit and uh, I don't know that anyone really knows um, truly how many clinical audit professionals there are out there working in the NHS and, and the wider healthcare community um, and one of the, the points that we probably should raise around the limitations of the, of the survey is that you know, CAS don't have time or funding to specifically focus on this project. So we are limited to a degree in terms of the amount of feedback we are able to provide, although we do produce um, a full report with, with all the, the data provided in it um, every year. Turning our attention to the validity of the survey, we note that NQI can have raised some concerns as regards the survey over the last couple of years, particularly around um, some of the phrasing of the questions and the response rate. Um, just to, um, to give a bit of an explanation from our perspective, we've not changed the, the phrasing of the questions because we wanted to retain consistency. And um, we note that if you look at the data, particularly the, the graphs that Trace has presented, there seems to be you know, a huge amount of consistency with results um, certainly not bouncing around from question to question and from year to year. Um, the response rate has uh, been increasing. So with over 200 responses in 2016, that represents the most we've ever had. So we're very pleased with that. Um, we note that NQI can have been sent the survey pretty much ever since the, the, uh, the survey was set up in 2010 and no real concerns were raised with regard to it prior to 2015. And Nick Black and Nagkai um, did always used to um, report and share the, the survey results and include those um, in a lot of their documentation when Nagkai were in existence. I guess our, our question to NAG, uh, NQI can would be um, if they have particular concerns around the data, what are the questions that they would um, would highlight in terms of the answers not being reflective of what they're seeing at a local um level within the, 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 the clinical audit community so it'd be great if um, NQI can could consider that and, um, and perhaps get back to us. Just to end with a few final thoughts we wanted to turn our attention back to the National Clinical Audit Programme as I think that tends to be the main talking point um, in the circles that we operate in and, and clearly um, as you've seen quite a lot of the, the results um, raise some some concerns around particularly the national audits. You'll see from this um, first slide that we just wanted to, to put up, this is a slide that was presented by Robin Burgess, um, the HQIP um, CEO, um, back in September 2010. It's just interesting to look at the, the threats that were being identified from a HQIP perspective um, in terms of when they were in 2010 looking at the future of um, clinical audit and you'll see that um, one of the key threats that they identified was the burden of national clinical audit and I think if we look at the results of our survey um, that is something that still clearly needs to be addressed and um, there is, is still you know, a huge amount of work um, being expected of, 
local clinical audit teams and clinicians to make these national clinical audit projects happen. Just taking a moment to turn our attention to the work carried out by YEARN, the Yorkshire Effectiveness and Audit Regional Network. Um, they conducted a, a, a study looking at um, their views on national clinical audit and you'll see on the screen they came up with quite an extensive um, list of, in effect, criteria for national clinical audits. Um, I think it's encouraging for us all really that pretty much all of the, the points raised by Yearn um, criss-cross over quite nicely with, um, with the findings of, of our survey and obviously Yearn have also identified that there are issues around uh, the burden um, of national clinical audit. As I'm sure you're aware, Yearn's work led to the publication of an article in the Health Service Journal in January 2017 focusing um, on national clinical audit, particularly around um, the sheer workload involved um, for many clinicians undertaking these, um, these national projects. What's interesting from the next slide, um, this is something we picked up from a HQIP event carried out on the 21st of March in 2017 and if you look on um, at the slide in a bit more detail, it outlines HGRIP's commissioning principles for national clinical audits. Um, it's probably worth having a look at a, a number of the bubbles that um, that sit around that, that central national clinical audit circle. But if you look at effectively one o'clock, one of HGRIP's key commissioning principles is that there is minimal data burden um, from national clinical audits. And I think that's something that... Um, needs to be looked at in, 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 in a lot more detail because we're not convinced that um, currently national clinical audits really are um, delivering minimal data burden for those involved. Indeed, bringing things right up to date, we've been contacted by a number of clinical audit teams and clinicians um, over the last couple of weeks in relation to the National Clinical Audit of Psychosis which is a national audit that's um, carried out by um, the Royal College of Psychiatrists. Interestingly, once again, the main concern seems to be around the workload involved for this audit. If you've seen this audit, um, trusts are being asked to complete a 17-page pro forma for each patient. In some instances, trusts are being asked to collect data on over 300 patients in quite short timescales. Um, and we've had a number of clinicians who have contacted us to say that um, you know, they're having to do this work in their own time uh, and if that's not the case they've been having to potentially not see patients in order to um, carry out the, uh, the, the clinical audit. The fact that there's a sequin attached um, to the, this national audit makes it um, very relevant to, to trust and it needs to be undertaken but the timescales involved in this audit have been incredibly short so the pressures around conducting the National Clinical Audit of Psychosis um, have been considerable. Once again um, we've had a lot of comments around the methodological approach taken by this audit particularly around sampling um, and the reliability of the data collection methods. Um, a common theme again seems to be that um, this is a quasi-research project rather than a clinical audit project and uh, it involves a huge amount of data trawl. I think to conclude on national clinical audits, the key message for us that seems to be coming out of our survey, coming out from Yearn, coming out from local clinical audit staff we meet and coming out from uh, the clinicians involved in national clinical audits is the burden is considerable and we really do need to take some steps to um, changing this urgently. So that's something for um, NQI can to consider and, and we know that um, NQI can do take um, you know, a huge amount of interest in national clinical audits and help contribute to the design of all new projects, which is, which is great news. Just this last slide, um, here are a few questions that we thought might be um, relevant for NQI can members to consider. So, in the first instance, we'd be keen to know whether NQI can members view the survey as useful. Um, as we've sort of already alluded, do members feel that the results reflect um, what they're hearing from those effectively working at what we'll call the clinical audit coalface? Um, 
I guess really importantly, how can NQI can and the wider networks use these results um, to share with others, to highlight key issues, and I guess most importantly, to how can these results and then how can this data be used to impact change um, and ensure the reinvigoration of, of clinical audit, which is which is something we would, you know, all um, say that we're working towards. Um, on a final note, we'd like to offer NQI can the opportunity to add um, maybe one or two questions for our forthcoming survey in 2017. So um, we would encourage NQI can to take that opportunity and get back to us with uh, what additional questions they think would be most valuable from their perspective. That pretty much concludes our presentation on the results of the 2016 um, CASC annual survey and obviously we've also focused on the results from the, the previous um, years dating back to 2010 as well. We'd like to thank NQI can for inviting us to present this information. The wider report is available via our website if people want to see that. And we um, welcome the opportunity to collaborate with NQI can and the networks in future. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.